grassroots economic organizing, catalyzing worker cooperatives and the solidarity economy for over 30 years. Visit us online at geo.coop. This interview with Ben Sandell of the CDS Consulting Cooperative was conducted by Jim Johnson of GEO and took place in November of 2013. Could you um, just you know, give, give me the 30-second elevator speech on uh, who you are or the 60-second elevator speech? Sure. Um, I am Ben Sandell. I am a consultant with CDS Consulting Co-op, working prim- well, almost completely on... Um, leadership development, governance, and capital, uh, capital campaigns, helping co-ops find the capital that they need for to start new co-ops or to expand their current co-ops. Um, I have not done that full-time terribly long, but I've been doing it part-time for about a year and a half, um, working as uh, both in part of the C-Build program, the Cooperative Board Leadership Development Program, at CDS Consulting Co-op, and also on the capital side working in the um, expansion, growth, and improving performance uh, area, which is the two, those are the two sides, basically, of CDS Consulting Co-op. Um, mm-hmm. Before uh-huh. that, I was the, bo- the board president of the Friendly City Food Co-op from incorporation until November of uh, 2011. We opened in June 2011. Um, and I was part of the forming, the founding team prior to that from the very beginning of the process. So from what would that have been, uh, 2006, I guess, uh, early mm-hmm. 2006 on. I was part of that. Prior to that, um, I have a background in conventional business um, in a variety of capacities, um, often dealing with small and uh, starting, st- small and startup businesses, um, grew up in a family business, was on the board of another food co-op through a uh, somewhat tumultuous period of expansion and uh, of recovery from financial difficulties and then <laughs> expansion, um, and have been involved with food co-ops in one way or another for 25 or so years from, you know, being a tofu rinser uh, and on. So that's kind of uh, where I come from, and I guess my... My personal, uh, my, you know, besides that, I enjoy working with groups who are starting co-ops and are working on co-ops. I enjoy working with them very much. Personally, I feel like uh, the cooperative business structure and the role that cooperatives play in society as social institutions that are also businesses is really critical, and. Um, is is really essential to a more peaceful, just society. So that's kind of my personal mm-hmm. uh, motivation for working in this field. Excellent. Um, I want to do want to get to the meat of the interview in a minute here, but I st- want to sort of start off by asking you a little more about your friendly city experience in particular. Mm-hmm. Yep. Five five years to start up. Yes, five and a half. Five and a half years. Any reflections on that? Like how typical it is, or how appropriate it was. Um, Um, We had, you know, because it was 2006 through 2011, you know, we mm -hmm. had a major financial Mm -hmm. meltdown in the country in that period, which I think probably delayed us somewhat. But, and, you know, at the time we started, and there was not as much, not nearly as much activity at that time in co-op development. And they were saying, you know, it should, you know, 18 to 24, maybe 36 months should be plenty to start a new Mm -hmm. co-op. I don't see it. Um, Or you would have to have a very particular set of circumstances that would be highly favorable to do it in that amount of time. I think Mm -hmm. the amount of time we took is probably a little too long. We were very lucky and worked very hard to maintain focus, energy, um, community engagement. I think, you know, we definitely did hear various, grumblings about you guys are never going to get this open, we're losing confidence. Um, so it was a little too long, in my opinion, but on the other hand, it was the time it had to take for us in our particular situation to get all the pieces together and to do it to the quality level that we were shooting for. Um, so 
you know, I can look at various aspects of the process and say we might have been able to go faster here or maybe we could have done that differently and it would have happened sooner. But on the other hand, there's nothing, there's no part of the outcome that I can say, you know, we overdid that or I wish we had not gone as far. So in terms of the amount of money we raised, the, the strength and quality of the organization we created, um, the general manager that we hired, you know, there's no place there that like, ah, we could have done that, you know, we could have cut a corner there. So uh -huh. um, it was the amount of time it had to take. Uh, typical, still unclear. I think I, I do think we could get it, you know, I think 36 to 48 months is much more, it, it, well, is achievable and uh -huh. is more mindful to the fact that, you know, these are vo generally volunteer efforts that take a lot of people. So uh -huh. it's very hard to sustain a volunteer effort for that long yes. um, period. So that's, that's very much why I asked, yeah. Yeah, so three to four years is what I would think is more reasonable. And in that time, there's going to be turnover of people, uh, turnover uh -huh. of volunteers. Now, again, our group happened to be rather cohesive, and we concentrated on both the, um, you know, we, we concentrated on all the nuts and bolts of opening a co-op while also maybe not always consciously, but we were nevertheless always also uh, developing a cooperative culture. And, and by that I mean, you know, working together, asking for help, getting people engaged so that they would take part beyond just simply paying their money, um, and having fun, you know, seeing this as a community building effort, as a social effort that meant that, you know, if we were getting to a point where it was not fun, we had to look at that a little bit and say, well, you know, is this just a temporary thing we need to get through in order to fulfill whatever is the current goal, or are we off track and we need to get back on track to making this a fun process so that people want to still be involved with it, you know, we, the, um, we definitely did not want, and I think we were actively working against the uh -huh. maybe outdated stereotype of co-ops being full of sourpuss vegans who, you know, uh, yeah, who don't believe in fun. Um, <laughs> we wanted to make sure that that we really projected, you know, it, it was not by chance that we chose a name that has friendly right in the name. Uh, besides that it's the nickname for our community, too, the Friendly City, but it, we also just wanted to stress that. You know, one of our other uh -huh. nicknames is Rock Town. And when we thought uh -huh. about what is the message you send with Rock Town and what is the message you send with Friendly City, uh -huh. you know, we liked the softer, friendlier, what I felt was a more inviting uh, name. Anyway, so, uh -huh. you know, we wanted to make sure uh -huh. that there was fun and openness and friendliness involved in the whole process. Um, uh -huh. So five and a half a years more, a little longer. It, well, it's all right. Just a couple more questions yeah. about startup. I, I'm realizing we might have a nice sidebar maybe yep. about okay. your startup in particular or something like that um, because, um, you know, you're, you wouldn't say that you're in a major metropolitan area. No. We're, right. I mean, we're, we have about 40,000 people, uh, maybe mm -hmm. a little more than that now, in our city. Mm -hmm. um, and if you include the county, I think that is a maybe mm -hmm. is a little more than double that, or our our, our uh, I'm, I'm, trade area is a little more than double that size. Yeah, I'm on Wikipedia right now. 2010 census, 48,914. Okay, for okay. Harrisonburg, and for the Harrisonburg, Virginia metropolitan statistical area, yes. which is um, includes the county, I think. Is 126,562. Okay, that, that makes sense. Our uh, trade area, as defined in our market study, may have been slightly smaller than that, simply because mm -hmm. our county includes. Uh, yeah. it, our county is very large geographically and includes a couple areas that are just the. They're folks that don't come over here to shop, or they do very, yeah. very, very rarely. So they're, you know, geographically possibly closer to Charlottesville than Harrisonburg. Yeah. And anyway, so but, yes, that's, but those yeah. numbers are basically correct. I would point out that, uh, you know, I'm looking also at the historical population here, and it's been growing very, qu very quickly since its founding, really. Mm -hmm. um, 
and uh, include 20% since uh, 2000, 31% between 1990 and 2000, 56% between 1980 and 1990. Hmm. So I guess that's helpful to you. I was going to ask you generally whether you thought being in a town like Harrisonburg, as opposed to being in a metro- major metropolitan area, would be easier yeah. or harder. Is it There's easier or harder to start in Harrisonburg as opposed yeah. to a big city? There's real pluses and minuses. I mean, on the one hand, we were able to find a downtown location with parking at mm. a rate per square foot that might not be as low as you might think for a community like ours, but is certainly lower than it would be in a real metropolitan area. Um, mm-hmm. The other side of the coin is you get population density and you uh, get median income that uh, are generally, well, potentially higher in urban areas than in our somewhat mm-hmm. agricultural area. Um, so, I mean, our median income is about 44000 and the we're generally looking at or thinking about like 50000 to 150000 as the prime median income for a population to support a food co-op. Mm. Um, but I think it did okay. give us, you know, it is a handleable size for us in that we could reach out to a lot of people across a lot of different, you know, uh, socioeconomic strata um, because, you know, we don't, it, uh, we only have one newspaper, and w- you know, it's so it's not. We're not. Our message wasn't drowning in the noise that you might have in a major metropolitan area. Um, so those challenges were slightly, slightly uh, less, I suppose. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, I I think that it's less a question of urban versus either smaller urban or agrarian. It really is more the makeup of the group. Of the of the community and what approach you're going to take, um, mm-hmm. because you know it could be that a community like ours, depending on you know, it happened to be that we were not, we did not have a lot of uh, intense competition here, but that's mostly because the chains that are in our area are you know somewhat lackluster, and one in particular had closed a few different locations mm-hmm. in the last few years because of their own financial reasons. Conventional you know, stores you're talking about, right? Yeah, conventional grocery stores, right. So mm-hmm. uh, on the other hand, you know, we, I think if you compare us to like an Ithaca, New York, or a Burlington, Vermont, you know, mm. they're, they have a much better median income and education level and a mo- what you might consider the more traditional co-op shopper, but they have more, you know, competition too. They've got more health food stores. I don't know if they have the big chains, Whole Foods, and... Trader Joe's and things like that, but, uh-huh. you know, we don't have any of those here. We do have them over the mountain in Charlottesville. Okay, but you don't have, uh, right, right there in Harrisonburg, you don't have any competition, essentially. Well, we have, we do have, uh, I mean, we we analyzed our competition in detail, and we have two um, what would be called natural food stores, potentially. They're both a little more towards vitamins and supplements. Mm-hmm. than they are food, um, and certainly they're not much on fresh food, but we do have two thriving stores like that. Um, mm. We also have, uh, it, you know, all the conventional grocery stores have natural and organics in their stores, some better than others. Um, oh, we, yeah. have two, we have two super Walmarts in our, commu- in our city proper, um, mm-hmm. you know, and Walmarts are the largest oh. organic retailer in the country, so yeah. mm. although that's that's a little bit misleading because mm-hmm. it's primarily based on soy milk. But nevertheless, right. um, you know, there are options here, but it's true there is not mm-hmm. the kind of, you know, super attractive Whole Foods style or mm-hmm. kind of funky alternative Trader Joe's style. There was nothing quite like that present in our, for, in our market. For, pe- for people who are eating substantially natural or organic, you guys are the. O- it's fair to say you guys are the only one stop. Yeah, right? correct. I, I would say yeah. that. Yes. Yeah, and a um, couple things. This you're providing me with a nice segue into like the more general industry-wide issues, but I want to clarify one thing first. Mm-hmm. Um, your exact relationship with CDSCC again. Um, you're not speaking for CDSCC. You're speaking as an individual. But are you a full member? I am a full member. Uh, we're we're a shared services cooperative. So each member. Mm-hmm 
each owner is a an independent consultant. So I have mm-hmm. my practice that I do through them, but it is right. you know I'm not employed by them. I am right. self employed, uh, but I am a full member of CDS Consulting mm-hmm. Co-op. Yes. Okay, so you provided me with a couple of nice segues here. A part of it was competition and um, small town versus big town, because most of our readers, most of the population is going to be in a big town. Yeah. So to me, that's an interesting story. Certainly, bigger cities, lots of zoning, lots of regulations, higher real estate prices, things like that. Our, I, don't, I would not say any of our zoning or uh, <laughs> code practices were any less onerous yeah. than a big city. That In that regard, you know, we have sprinklers yeah. in our walk-in freezer, our walk-in cooler, and outside. <laughs> So in that regard, we, we didn't save any money be, you know, on, on code stuff. <laughs> the, um, the thing that comes to mind, though, is D.C., where it seems like it's almost impossible to start a co-op in downtown D.C. now. Yeah. And, um, and that we have more co-ops in the suburbs, well, basically. Well, the challenge is, is very different. I mean, I agree it would be very, very – it is a lot harder, but then again, you know – Whole Foods has a store at what is their kind of? Uh, don't they have one that's like fifteenth like, and P? They have one at fifteenth and P. 14th, yeah, on P Street between fourteenth right. and fifteenth. So now yeah. they're obviously finding a you know a financial model that works for having yeah. those stores in urban areas. Mm-hmm. Co-ops can too, but yeah. it is harder. Definitely. Harder. Well, it's it's they need really deep pockets, from what I understand. Correct me if I'm wrong. It still takes them years to to break even or to get their money back, right? I I would imagine so. I don't have any data on them, but mm-hmm. I would imagine that's the case. So mm-hmm. yes, it is going to be a, a. I mean, with all when we do our financial projections for food co-ops, we're doing ten years of projections, and some mm-hmm. co-ops need all ten years in order to achieve profitability, which also means you need substantial startup capital to take you through that time period. Right. And, you know, in that regard, yes, an urban co-op is going to be more challenging for that. It also may be that the model will be less conventional of what you try to right. open for an urban co-op. Um, and that's, mm-hmm. an area, that's something, that's a question that's still very, very much wide open. We don't really know yeah. what that mm-hmm. model looks like exactly, but Name the model you're describing there. We're talking about a successful urban startup in a big city nowadays. Correct. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yes. That's what I'm talking about. And and what that mm-hmm. successful urban startup might look like compared to even one that, you know, Tacoma Park is not exactly suburban, but right. it's it's more of what we've seen as the conventional successful co op model where you have parking right next to the store. Um mm-hmm. You have enough square footage that you can have a fairly full featured store. You have access for delivery trucks um, Mm -hmm. that's not always just parking out front on the street. So, you know, with an urban market, you run, you know, those are some of the key challenges is how can you support the cost per square foot? how you know especially how can you have a large enough store to be anything more than a convenience store um, mm-hmm. and especially if you're not necessarily focusing on the conventional convenience store profit makers of you know malt liquor and cigarettes and snack right. foods um, <laughs> which is you know i mean that's where a lot of corner stores yeah. make a substantial yep. amount of profit um, and yeah. it brings people in regularly yep um yep. And how do you do it with little or no parking and with little or no access to trucks? We don't know the answer to that yet. Let's go back to Friendly City just for a second and sure. say, how is Friendly City doing on startup? Can you, you know, how are your projections on break even? Is that information you can share? Yeah, oh, absolutely. <clears throat> it's doing great. And uh-huh. interestingly, or, well, to me it's all interesting, but what I find um, significant about the financial performance of Friendly City is that through our planning, we were we were very conservative in we tried to be very conservative in our financial planning. And what has happened, especially the first after the first full year of operations, our sales were slightly lower than we had forecast and we had budgeted for that period. Wow. Um, so we had budgeted like I think two point 
two million, mm-hmm. and they were right about around two million for that first e- well, full year. But well, okay. our, our margin was slightly better, and our labor costs were slightly lower, and we had started with slightly less debt than we originally had in our pro forma projections. So primarily because of the great work of the GM maintaining margin and and uh, being very careful with labor costs, we mm-hmm. ended up losing substantially less than we forecast. Interesting. So, okay. You know, we were we were bracing ourselves for losses in you know the four hundred thousand dollar range, and we actually ended up on paper losing maybe a hundred k, but actually in reality we our cash situation was very very good, and in fact our our Q4 of the first fiscal year, fourth quarter, we actually made a little money, which was somewhat of a anomaly because there were a few good things that happened that aren't necessarily repeatable, but nevertheless, it was certainly great to actually show a yeah. profit that early in the process, which is still, <laughs> you know, years before we forecast that we would be turning a profit. Let me touch on that for a second. Once you're done your point, I don't want to interrupt you, but I... Yeah, well, just that, you know, financially we're doing great. Our growth is, I think, better than um, <laughs> we had originally forecast. Our growth is, that is, the percentage of growth year, uh, year over year is, is better so far. Um, uh-huh. And the consumers, you know, our our community seems to really like the store a lot. Uh, certainly, uh-huh. it's got areas that need to be improved, but it all stores do. But it's functioning uh-huh. pretty well. Staff turnover uh-huh. has been no, you know, has there have certainly been some staff turnover, but generally it's been a good, stable staff. Um, yeah, so it's it's okay. we're very very happy with the performance of it. I wanted to touch on something to generalize a little into a startup 101 question Mm -hmm. that I think still might come to us as a surprise to a lot of people who are not in the business, Mm -hmm. and that is that, you know, you're talking about a food co-op, relatively successful startup food co-op, one one of the reasons I'm interviewing you, because you've been in the trenches of a startup in the last few years. Yep. And so that's the angle, one of the angles I feel that makes this very strong is, I'm talking to somebody who's done it, mm-hmm. you know, recently. Yep. And so, um, but one thing a lot of the readers might not know is that you have to expect food co-ops to lose money for years. Yeah, absolutely. When you start up in this environment. I think that might shock a lot of people. Can you, you share a, a little bit of information or general data, if you can, about, you know, what the expectation should be if you're sure. starting up a food co-op now and how many years should you expect to lose money, so to sure. speak, and, and related topics. Yeah, well, go ahead. Yeah, and the, the um, it, a- absolutely, and, you know, any new business from scratch is going to lose money. One of, I think one of the conceptual differences with some conventional businesses versus the cooperative model is that, you know, if you are an owner or a partner in a business, mm-hmm. there is often the understanding or the expectation that you will be working in that business concertedly and at, mm-hmm. with very little financial return initially. So you sweat may have equity, one, right? Pardon? Sweat equity, right? Sweat equity. So you may have a couple people, maybe more than a couple, who are putting in an enormous amount of time and effort, potentially an unsustainable amount. Right. and are doing that at minimal or zero compensation, which can make those type of businesses achieve profitability sooner. Um, mm-hmm. But with a cooperative business where, you know, even if you are, well, let's not even go down the path yet of talking about volunteer labor, which doesn't save any money, uh, we've well, found. Um, right. You're paying for management and staff, and... You are uh, in an industry that is has very low margins and has a high cost of admission, um, or that is, the, the startup costs are substantial when you look at the infrastructure that you need to have, the freezers, the coolers, the plumbing, the electrical, the back end, the point of sale, um, alarms, um, you know, uh-huh. uh, fire suppression, all the pieces, the HVAC that's required, all of those are... You know, none of it is cheap, and it's very, very hard to do that, you know, kind of uh, like seat of the pants. Um, right. I mean, yes, you can buy used coolers, but they very mm-hmm. well may be 
ultimately they may be a, a much more expensive choice than buying a sure. brand new cooler or freezer for a variety of reasons. Right. So right. um, it's a you know it's not at all unusual to see a co-op take uh, five to eight years to achieve profitability. Wow. Um, okay. And and certainly we are seeing some that the pro forma simply don't work. That you know, right. ten years out, they're still losing money and may not be moving in the right direct. You know, it may not appear that at that point they are going to. You know, uh, the numbers might just not work for them. And so, and the things that. A lot, what changes across that five to eight years when when a co-op crosses that threshold from losing money to not losing money, right? Mm -hmm. What you mean by profitability is actually you're making actually making more than you're spending in a right. quarter. You become right? sustainable, self-sustaining. Yeah. Yes. And and the difference there is, correct me if I'm wrong. They're paying down loans. Their revenues generally are increasing. Their internal processes generally are becoming more efficient as the staff becomes more experienced. Am I hitting all the points here? What yeah, is it that makes the absolutely. difference there? I mean, that is what's happening, and the real biggies are your sales are growing and your debt is dropping. Yeah. Um, because, yes, you are achieving some, you know, your, your staff is getting better and better, your inventory is getting better and better, but those are somewhat increment, or they're very incremental because the, change, the amount of change they make is relatively small. Certainly staff is a big deal um, because that mm -hmm. can, you know, you can eat up a lot of money with, in the staff costs, but I think mm -hmm. the biggest things we're seeing with startups are that, you know, initially you have to be able to raise enough money to have that working capital to get you till that point, and then you have to be able to have suitable cash flow to pay off the debt. I mean, ideally, like in our case, Partly because you know we, well, I guess just because of the combination of of the way our pro, our pro financial projections looked, we will mm. actually be able to achieve profitability while still paying down debt. So we will be sustainable mm -hmm. even with a debt load, um, which is a nice position to have if you have to wait till you've actually retired all of your initial debt, which is mm -hmm. easily ten years. You know that can be very challenging. That's going to mean a lot of working capital up front to sustain you through that time period. Um, and it may also restrict the ability of your general manager and staff in that time period. I mean, like one scenario might be that you're growing well and you're serving your community well, mm -hmm. but additional space in your building opens up and you'd like to expand. Well, if you're still, you know, mm -hmm. you may have working capital, but if you have not achieved sustainability, self-sustainability yet, and you still have substantial debt, you might not be able to take advantage of that opportunity right. to grow your business and serve your, your owners better. I just wanted to touch on the, the harsh realities of startup and, you know, to um, make sure people realize that, you know, losing money for five to eight years is typical. Yes, it's not in, unusual. In a, successful, in a successful startup. Right. Yeah. Yep. So... And well, that's I, and very I, helpful. I don't have comparative yeah. data with, you know, like Whole Foods, but I'm mm -hmm. sure, if anything, their stores are substantially more expensive than your typical co-op startup, just in terms of the, you know, they're, they're, they are pretty first-rate stores. And not mm -hmm. that ours aren't, but I think we can make up with our unique design and local flavor, we can make our stores present very similarly in quality, but at slightly less money slightly less startup mm -hmm. cost, and also because generally, and maybe this is not a generalization that I can back up, but my, my feeling is that people who are the management and staff of food co-ops are highly dedicated people who really want this to be a great thing and are dedicated to their, their co-op and their community, which is a little different than, you know, you're our highest performing manager in the whole food system, so we want to move you to our new startup in Dubuque, Iowa, and we're going right. to pay all your moving costs, and we're going to pay you substantially to be there, and you may or may not love Dubuque, but you'll be there until the next startup needs you, which is a different right. financial set of circumstances. Okay, I, I, want to, I want to go off on a tangent about that for a second because that's a, a little bit of a deep point, but it's something I want to cover for at least a couple minutes. Okay. The concept of a, of a startup team, which 
when Whole Foods moved to Silver Spring, that was something that I became aware of for the first time. That yes, they have, they have they a have team that's dedicated to getting stores started. And it's like experienced people who go from startup to startup to startup. Correct me if I'm wrong. Correct. And you see, and, and the, I think the advantages of that are obvious. And sure. um, it, critical advantages, is there any chance that the food co-op sector could do the same thing? Well, there is think? somewhat of that in the NCGA development co-op. So huh. the, the, NCG, the, the NCGA has their DC, which is, it, in some ways it does that. It doesn't actually huh. bring a manager in, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. in terms of the support they provide pre- and post-opening, it's really yeah. extraordinary. And uh, oh, mm-hmm. certainly in our situation, it was, and we were coming into it with not just an experienced cooperative manager, but someone who had also had experience opening a Whole Foods. So this guy mm-hmm. knew you know, a lot about opening a store, our GM, and it was still hugely, massively helpful to him and to his staff to have the the NCGA DC support in that time frame. Um, Because, you know, there are a million questions that have to be answered as part of leading a co-op process. And as the general manager, who's now, you know, the head of the build-out, he's, you know, he or she is interacting with the contractors and the designers and the architect and the store planner and the interior designer and the you know, most likely also having contact with the city or county with code and regulations and, you know, dealing with the board and, you know, huge, massive amount of work. So by having the NCGA DC team that came and helped set shelves and helped, you know, advise, helped train the staff, helped, you know, make sure that throughout the store, departmentally, the displays were as good as they could possibly be so that the initial impression people got when the doors opened was yeah. really, really good, really positive. Yeah. It was just hugely, you know, it was like the cavalry uh, riding in when the rest of the troops are exhausted and out of ammunition. You know, yeah. it, re- it really was great. Well, amazing. Um, yeah. Okay, that segues nicely into this NCGA's development cooperative. That's well, interesting. Yeah, and, and let me add one other piece to that yeah. startup, you know, that, starting team. Yeah. The other thing, too, that is a unique aspect of the cooperative industry is that we had managers from other co-ops who also came yeah. and spent two weeks straight at our co-op wow. working every day next to wow. our management team, just helping make it happen, sharing their experience. And, and, and at the same time, also, we would have you know, team leaders from our co-op going to you know, Rono wow. or going to other co-ops wow. to spend a week with them to learn how they do it and to meet people in, you know, suppliers in the industry and to, you know, just to learn and get that confidence building perspective of having someone who has done this before saying, yep, that's the way you do it. Or, well, here, let me give you a suggestion, you know. So yeah. that was another piece yeah. of it that even for the co-ops that will not have access to the NCGA DC mm-hmm. capabilities, there's also a lot of amazing help. Yeah that you, well, know, you, know, you may need to ask for it. It's not like they're going to just show up without that yeah. relationship being created, but if you're, if you're to the point of opening the doors, hopefully you've already yeah. gotten very good at building relationships. So. This is an, an extraordinary example of Principle 6. Yeah, that absolutely. I, absolutely. That I, that, and I was not fully aware. I was not aware that it was that expensive, both, extensive, both in the NCGA Development Cooperative and also the help you got from other managers. What did Friendly City have to do, as an example, to qualify for that, to get that well, kind of attention from NCGA? The, the, um, I can tell you what we did. I certainly cannot speak at all for NCGA, right. but my experience has been that the criteria is still under, they're, they're still looking at what works. So right. the criteria we met, met might not be today's criteria. Right, but, and it sounds like the standard is maybe flux, in a bit of flux, even, I think or it still might being be. developed. Yes, yeah. um, and also, you know, they're looking at how best, I mean, it worked well for us, but I, I can imagine yeah. situations where that might yeah. not have right. been as effective. But well, it's, I, an extraordinary, it's an extraordinary investment of resources, and so 
you know, naturally they're going to be looking at the risk involved and trying to make sure that they're putting those resources in a place where it's best to actually, like, bring a new co-op into being. Yeah. Right, and as far as I know, these arrangements were made between the NCGA, DC, and mm-hmm. our general manager. So the, as a board leader, I was not necessarily seeing a lot of the details. I did look over the contract um, mm-hmm. at the request of the general manager, but from what I remember and understood, ideally they would have liked our first-year sales to be higher in order to qualify mm-hmm. for the program. Our right. projected sales of whatever they were, two, 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 three, were probably still a little low for them. Um, mm-hmm. But we were above $2 million, so that was, I think, one mm-hmm. piece of it. I don't think this was stated, but we had used a documented process throughout. So we had followed the four cornerstones in three stages. We had used quite a bit of professional consulting, high-quality consulting in the cooperative uh-huh. world. Okay. So they were able to look at that and say, you know, have these people gotten the professional help to ensure right. that as much as we can ensure that they're going to have a high-quality outcome? You had been using a development model with which they had co- in which they had confidence. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, we signed a purchasing agreement to be part of their you know their group purchasing CAP. program. You joined CAP. Is it still called CAP? I'm not sure if that's what it's called or not, um, but I, okay. I think it's if it's not, it's the offshoot of that. Right. So we had right. you know, we had agreed to put a substantial amount of our purchasing in that program. We also put, I believe, a forty-two or forty-three thousand dollar bond up. So we took forty-two thousand dollars of our initial startup capital and gave it to them to hold on to as security. That if we were unable to pay our bills, that they would then be able to use that to pay us off, and then they would move us to COD. So that was a painful moment. But I understand it from their perspective, too. They are going, you know, they have all these agreements with suppliers and put a lot of resources into Mm -hmm. marketing, into the development, you know, help that they provide. They want to make sure that we're not going to fill our store and then go bust and not be able to pay the bill. So, um, and they did, after a year of of good payment, they uh, have refunded us half of that deposit half still remains on on account with them. But anyways, mm-hmm. that was part of the process for us was putting that up front. And then as part of an N- you know when you become an NCGA co-op, a certain percentage of your sales, your you, you have your annual dues or however you want to look at I'm not even sure how they whether they call them dues or fees or membership mm-hmm. costs, but it's based on a percentage of your sales. So, um, and all NCGA co-ops do that. That's what funds their operations. So that was, you know, the, the, I guess the key qualification components were having right. followed that plan, um, signing the the, agree, the purchasing agreement, being able to put up the initial deposit money. Those were probably the yeah. main pieces. Okay. Joining the um, aggregate distribution effort, the aggregate purchasing and distribution project, I can see that was a key part of it because with the successful co-op, then all of the co-ops in the in this CAP program or whatever it's called these days would um, would increase their buying strength, Correct. basically. Correct. Ch- chances are there's some understanding between NCGA and the vendors that, hey, we're going to you know work hard to increase sales for you, and in return, you're going to give us these very, very favorable prices. You're going to give us special sales that you will not be extending you know, to right. your non-cooperative customers. So, mm-hmm. yeah, NCGA needs more co-ops involved, and they need growth in the co-ops they have, but they also want to be very careful that these co-ops are not going to create a financial burden on exactly. the current members of the NTGA and on the vendors who are, you know, generally had good favorable relationships with them. This segues nicely into one section of our meat here, if you'll pardon the expression, mm-hmm. which is upsides and downsides of the CAP program. It sounds like it's a, it's a, a critical strategic advantage, but it's also a major commitment. It's a major commitment. You know, certainly the, for us, we had not budgeted that money, so we had to figure out where it was going to come from and add it to our pro forma. And, yes, it's a commitment, although we will not speak for our general manager, but mm-hmm. my 
feeling is that he was glad to do this and to be a part of it, that from his perspective, it only helps him because he's getting the assistance that otherwise he would have had to pay additionally for or would have just found hard to come by, you know, in terms of having this direct line to the NCGA to say, hey, I got a question or I need help. And the purchasing agreement means that we have, you know, the nice circular in the store, um, these advertising materials, the co-op advantage pricing and marketing aids. You know, it's, it's a plus for him because that's stuff that, Otherwise, he either would have no access to or would be trying to figure out himself or with his staff, what are we going to put on sale? Are we just going to eat our margin on it, or are we actually going to get a consideration from a vendor? Who's going to do the negotiation mm-hmm. with the vendor, et cetera? And, you know, frankly, what vendor, you know, we're a $2 million, two and mm-hmm. a half, you know, moving towards $2.5 million a year co-op, we don't mm-hmm. have a lot of bargaining to talk about, hey, you know, could you cut us a deal on 20 cases of juice? Well, mm-hmm rather than, you know, being a part of the NCGA. So there were some challenges, and I think that one of the major challenges for co-ops looking at this program is that if they're not planning on achieving that level of sales either first year or very, very soon thereafter, then they may not even be considered for the program. And that is, I think, a big challenge. You know, what do you do about that? Do you... Mm -hmm. If you're in a if you're a developer, do you move forward with your plan as is? Do you look to see what it would require for you to be able to open at that size? And he, and you know those the numbers they're looking at are not entirely arbitrary. They're looking at the history right. and what's succeeded and what's not. And it's you know the mm-hmm. rate of success of smaller co-ops is much much lower. Mm-hmm. Right, right. I hear that. I'm going to touch more on the smaller co-ops in a few minutes. Mm-hmm but I wanted to stay on the CAP program specifically. I've heard from smaller co-ops that uh, CAP can constrain co-ops that want to buy more local, that there's a minimum threshold that a co-op needs to buy from CAP as part of, uh, to call it the CAP program for the time being, that there's a minimum amount that a co-op has to buy. They can't just buy as much or as little as they want. To buy into this program, they have to commit to buying a certain amount of their goods. Mm-hmm. certain percentage of their inventory. Am I wrong about that? Um, I don't know. I mean, my sense would be you are probably right. I don't have mm-hmm. that. I don't have the exact figures or uh, on that. I, mm-hmm. In our case, I do not believe it was any constraint on our general manager and his, his team mm-hmm. leaders who you know, were doing the buying. Because in order to have a full-service grocery store, we're buying plenty from them. They're yeah. uh, great. You know, they're, they are a, a high-quality supplier for us. By sales volume or dollars, I think we did about 25% of our business local in the mm-hmm. last year, which is quite good. I think that compares to kind of national average for conventional grocery stores of about 6% local. You um, say it's 25%? Overall, or 25% of produce, or no, 25% of our total sales of the store, or 25% of the cost of goods spent. Wow, went to local suppliers. So wow, that that is great. Yeah, and it was. I mean, it was a it was a very strong focus. Our general manager was dedicated to that. That's a passion of his. One of our first employees was uh, their title was food forager, who you know traveled the back roads talking to everybody, you know, old order farmers with no phones in their house about whether they might be interested in being a supplier and what they produce and how much of it and wow. to what standard. Wow. So, you know, we put a lot of effort into uh, cultivating that. You know, there are also mm-hmm. some, some huge challenges with local, um, especially supply, steady supply, pricing. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Uh, you know, local is great, and I think everybody, all co-ops are looking at it, and it's a place that you can really distinguish yourself competitively against corporate and conventional grocery, um, even corporate natural and organic. Um, but it is really challenging. Yeah. I'm not really yeah. sure if the NCGA program would limit, you know, would, would yeah. in practice actually yeah. limit it. In theory, maybe, well, but I think the reality yeah, right. is you need all that stuff to have a 12-month-a-year store. Well, 25% of your cost of goods is local. It can't be constraining you very much. 
I right. don't, I don't think so. Um, and again, you know, okay. like I said, we've gone. Uh, our our staff has really worked ultra hard. So we've got two or three different hot sauces that are, and you know, the definition of local changes depending on what it is. Sure. And you yeah, know, so yeah. like within Virginia, that in some cases that's local. Many right. of our eggs come from like eight miles away, so that's also local. Right. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, the, our, our general manager has worked very hard on that. According to the annual report, 25 percent of our expenses, or three hundred twenty-five thousand two hundred fifty dollars, was spent locally, compared to a conventional grocer's six percent average. So mm-hmm. that may be both a combination of inventory and other expenses. Uh, I'm not mm-hmm. sure exactly how he breaks that down, but nevertheless, it's 25% mm-hmm. compared to conventional 6%. Okay, excellent. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, okay, well, that, that's very, very helpful. You, you, co-ops are growing but still losing market share. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And so do you have numbers on how fast the natural foods industry in general is growing versus how fast the co-op sector is growing? Um, you have you know, those, those numbers have got to be out there. I don't have those here um but you know you 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 look at it you can kind of you know your gut can tell you this that the amount of Mm -hmm. natural and organics that are showing up in conventional sources even at walmart is growing um Mm -hmm. the amount of food sensitivities or maybe our awareness of them and our attention to them is growing so you know celiac and lactose Mm -hmm. and all the various other you know, challenges out there for people, there's now more more that's being created for them, and it's driving people to look for alternatives, which often means naturals, organics, stuff that in the past had generally only been found at co-ops and health food stores, but now you've right. got the Food Lions and the Kroger's and the Safeways and the Walmarts who are beginning to carry some of this stuff. I don't have the the numbers on this, but, you know, you look at the last 20 years, many of the brands that used to be independent brands serving, you know, almost mm-hmm. exclusively co-ops and natural organics have been purchased right. by big national brands. You know? Totally. I see that. Uh, and so, which means their distribution also tends to really broaden when that happens. Right. I see that. And, yeah, very much. They start making, somebody can pay the slot fees, and they start showing up in conventional grocery stores. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think the, Honest um, Tea is owned either by Pepsi or Coke. I don't recall right. which one, but you know, <laughs> yeah, instantly when they're yeah. coming on that truck, well, yeah. he's going to stock them anywhere darn where, you know place he pleases in the store, and it's probably going to be a prominent place. And so, the, and he's um, going to start doing that in every store, not just in you know natural and organic stores. So there's a couple different ways to look at growth here, at least a couple different ways. One is stores. Yeah. There's more Whole Foods or there's more food co-ops or there's more Trader Joe's or something. Okay? Yeah. Yes. And, um, but another way to look at the growth is uh, conventional stores, existing stores, not traditionally natural or organic, stocking more natural and organic products. Absolutely. And yep. Uh, and uh, I assume those are the two major ways. Am I missing anything? Are those b- basically the two channels through which the industry is growing? Yeah, I'm not aware of anything else, mm-hmm. but that seems right. And, you know, as an example, I was in my hometown of Rochester, New York this summer, which is also the corporate home of Wegmans, which is mm-hmm. still a family-owned or family-controlled uh, grocery chain that's now quite large and is also, mm-hmm. I think, generally considered to be a very high-quality right. conventional grocery chain. Um, mm-hmm. Their presentation is very good. Their uh, house-branded stuff is very good. It's just a ni- they're nice stores, you know, mm-hmm. no, no two ways about it. And I was surprised and impressed, frankly, um, going into a couple of their stores that they had all over the store, they had special signage noting organic alternatives they had on the shelves. So rather than have a, a, you know, as some stores do, is Mm -hmm. their natural section over here? And, you know, we've got everything kind of uh, ghettoized in one corner of the store. That's what Giant is doing here now. Yeah. They're they're doing the ghettoization or they're putting it all over? They're they're doing the ghettoization, Mm -hmm. including some stores that had distributed it around. They've shifted to a ghettoized model, which surprised me. 
So Go Wegmans ahead. is from their a lot of their house brands are now organic, and they're putting it mm-hmm. right next to. So you'll have you know organic Cheerios next to conventional Cheerios, but even mm-hmm. beyond that, they're putting a sign there that not just says organic, but says here's why organic is better for you because of fewer wow. pesticides, because it's better for our environment. And at every checkout, they have a sign wow. that says, consider purchasing organic instead of conventional in all your future wow. shopping wow. and giving real reasons for it. So I'm looking at this and be like, you know, this is why the market share is growing in, you know, conventional corporate grocery. You, w- mm. you know, they're probably an outlier in that I imagine, certainly we have nothing in our community in the conventional groceries, anything mm-hmm. like it. But I imagine they're doing this in all their stores throughout their organization, and so they're definitely building awareness in a much larger audience that, oh, yeah, maybe I should think about that. Or, you know, if my kid has been getting sick all the time, maybe, you know, food could be a reason or an area that I could improve his life or her life. Well, and clearly Wegmans sees this as a strategic opportunity. Absolutely. A big one. A big one. This isn't just oh we got to do this because everybody else is doing it. Right. Okay. They're they're you they're leading with it's, it or they're a, trying to. Yeah, it's a strong differentiator against their com- competitors, and you know conventional grocery grows the sales growth is pretty much the the rate of population growth, whereas mm-hmm. natural organics are growing much faster than that. Yes. Um, yeah. And so yeah, they're definitely seeing this as a major differentiator, something they can point to. And I think they're also seeing it as something that, and this is an area that I think co-ops should totally pay attention to, because of the quality of their organization, Mm -hmm. they can do this better than many of their competitors. And I think co-ops also can do it better. Quality of organization, do you mean really quality of management? Tightness of operation? ordering, merchandising... You know, I mean, just like what I described as to the extent they're going in their merchandising, co-ops can do the same thing, can look at, you know, we already have great, and I think Wegmans also values their relationship with their consumers, their shoppers, and Uh cultivates it so that when they present this information, their their consumers are a little more likely to trust it than they might if they went to their food line and saw the same thing. So co-ops are growing but still losing market share. Is Wegmans and conventional grocers starting to carry some national and organic? Mm-hmm. Does that really does that really threaten food co-ops? Could it be the rising tide raises all boats and people get turned on to natural and organic and they might eventually end up be, becoming more attracted to a one-stop natural and organic place? No. Mm, well, I, I would say it's in between yep. that. Um, mm-hmm. I think there's mm-hmm. a real opportunity there. And mm-hmm. there is, I think the, the threat exists if food clubs don't do anything about it. If they continue to, to do mm-hmm. business as they've always done or as they've traditionally done, then, yes, mm-hmm. there's an absolute threat out there. Um, because one of the things that, and this is now where I guess I'd say this is veering into my experience and opinion, not necessarily backed mm-hmm. up by, you know, but anyways, enough right. provisos. You know, Wegmans has substantial financial capabilities that they are putting directly into new store growth and improving their existing stores. So they're using these funds in that way. Food Mm co-ops have often been reluctant, and now I'm talking less about new store from scratch, Mm -hmm. new co-ops from cooperatives, but more of existing cooperatives expanding and growing. They've tended to sit on their equity. You know, it's their members' money, and they're uh-huh. concerned about it, which is in some ways that makes sense and is a valuable perspective. So um, they don't keep reinvesting. But they don't keep no. reinvesting. So if they continue in that way, I think that is going to, you know, could be a major threat. That sitting mm. on this money means that eventually they'll earn less and they'll start using up their equity while their market share shrinks until they eventually mm-hmm. are out of money and they begin to lose money and they go out of business. So, yeah. you know, on the other hand, if they look at this rising tide, which I think does mm. exist, and say, "Awesome, you know, we've been we've been shouting this message for decades, and now yeah. it's being heard. Let's double mm. the size of our store and open three new ones because now we have demand to support it, and because oh, now we've turned into yeah. compared to our you know three decade ago store, 
now we are a first-rate retailer who can compete mm-hmm. head-to-head against anybody else who comes into our market, which, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, frankly, not many of those stores 30 years ago could have done that, 30, you know, head-to-head. They, they didn't have the right. presentation. They didn't have the staff mm-hmm. uh, capabilities. You know, it's Correct different. me if I'm wrong. They survived only because they were monopolies, essentially. Yeah, and because they were, you know, had a certain cachet that some people were, you know, willing to put yeah. up with uh, in order mm-hmm. to, you know, because mm-hmm. they had the cachet. You know, it's cool. Or, the, or, or, it's, or that some people liked. <laughs> yeah, or that some people liked. But it, it was yeah. restrictive to reaching a much wider uh, audience. Right. And so if, is it fair to characterize the old way, the sitting on equity approach, as complacent? Really? Could, yeah, I think that's a, w- a word you could use. Cautious yeah. might be a, ni- a nicer word. Right. Um, right. Well, ca- that cautiousness that maybe becomes complacency because reinvestment takes risk. Right. Or right? it turns into overly <clears throat> cautious. Yes. It does definitely yeah, over- take risk. But on the other hand, there's a great, even mm-hmm. greater risk, I think, in doing nothing. Well, and so if we're still losing market share, do we? Here's, here's the devil's advocacy question. Uh-huh. Yep. Can we really say that our current model, if we want to call it, that what we might call the dominant model, mm-hmm. the, the, I think there's only one model that we can say seems to be, well, there seems to be only one model that NCGA mm-hmm. feels comfortable with, and it's the, you know, it's the CDS model, essentially, right? Mm-hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I mean, and, that's, that's the one model that so far ha- appears to work over and over again. I would right. say it's the only one that comfortable with it's the one that they're using now because it has been proven over and over again i think right. uh everyone including ncga is looking out there to see what might work it, with different circumstances different sizes etc we just haven't right. really come upon that yet but everybody is looking for this that's that's good that's what i wanted to hear and that's something that i think a lot of people are not aware of um, you know, they might not even conceive of the fact that there is this one model and there's a sort of a general consensus amongst the seasoned food co-op people that this is by far the most proven model. Well, sure. I mean, but it is, it is it, the you know, most you proven model. You could call model. it the, the safest model. Yeah. What's that again? It, it is yeah. the most proven. It is the safest. Um, but also I think we all were faced with this situation where, you know, co-op mm-hmm. growth had been very slow for a very long time. So nobody yeah. really... You know, there was then, uh, you know, Stuart Reed and a bunch of others when, like, the original thinking behind Food Co-op 500 was mm-hmm. we got to get, right. we got to jumpstart the movement, and yeah. uh, which has worked. You know, all of a sudden there's this really incredible upswell in activity in starting new co-ops, and yeah. I think everyone now has been trying to, you know, I mean, we are still a small industry, so there's not a ton of overhead that can be instantly shifted to let's start working on this. So, you know, there is a le- little bit of a lag time. You know, you've got people like Bill Gessner, who's part of CDSCC, who is really, the, he is the person who created the four cornerstones in three stages model based mm-hmm. on, you know, 35 years of experience with new and expanding co-ops and with helping co-ops kind of move into a new era of professionalism and service. So, Uh you know, we know that that works pretty darn well and is reproducible. Uh But I think everyone is open to the idea of there's probably other ways too, but it's hard to, you know, we don't have, like Walmart, for instance, is experimenting with different size stores all over the country, various sizes, because they have the capabilities, financial capabilities, that they can open 20 stores of varying sizes, assess the performance, and then close the ones that don't work. Well, the right. food industry doesn't ha- have the resources to do that. So right. that's why we, we would love mm-hmm. to see some of these models out there, but there is a bit of a chicken and egg challenge here. Yes. That we need well, to see what works much. before we're going to put resources into it. We need to put resources into it before we can see it work. Well, and, and that's, that's sort of the devil's advocacy question that I have. is like, okay, we're growing, but we're still losing market share. Mm-hmm. And so... And we have this sort of prevailing model, and yet it sounds like folks are aware that we can't say our prevailing model is enough as long as we continue to lose market share. I'm looking at 
what is it we need to be doing, you know, and it's not just mm-hmm. a model question, but in the area of models, in order to do what we need to do, i.e., stop losing market share, hopefully get to the point where we're gaining market share, right. yeah. okay, what, what do we have to do to get there in terms of models? And I'm asking you to speculate speculate broadly here. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't entirely agree that we can that Mm -hmm. we're at that place now because I think we're still very low in the growth curve, and especially with existing co-ops, I think there there is a Mm -hmm. huge Mm -hmm. amount of potential with existing co-ops growing much more quickly than they have in the past, and some of them are embracing that and are even you know, trying to sort of codify it so that other co-ops can follow their lead. So like Wheatsville in Austin, Texas, they mm-hmm. created their big program, Business is Good, that's all oriented around, here's our mission, here's our vision, our global end, and if we want mm-hmm. to do it for more and more people and eventually, you know, kind of turn this into uh, the largest, you know, serving the largest number of people possible and improving our world the most we can, the best way we can do that is to continue to grow. And mm. that, you know, so they're, they're putting their, it's a change in, in thinking, and they're putting a lot of resources. They renovated their first store, which is their only store for the moment, um, mm-hmm. and substantially increased its size, and the business immediately followed. Uh, mm-hmm. So that was a huge financial success. Now they're in the process of building their second store in a different part of town, and and they're using the same model. You know, they're doing the right. same thing of you know putting the cornerstones in place, going through the stages. It works for new co-op startups and for expansions or new stores for existing co-ops. And and I think if anything, that model works. It works really well for startups and for existing co-ops. So that we are still losing market share is not so much that we still need more models. Yes, we do, but it's more that we've not begun to see successful co-ops really flex their muscles. Once Interesting. They get going, so you think that our prevailing model does not have shortcomings, that we're still realizing no, its no, potential. No, every model has shortcomings. Well, I, I'm, I'm overstating that. Yes. It's still realizing its potential. You say we're still at the beginning yes, of realizing absolutely. the potential still, of this prevailing model. Yet. Absolutely. You've not yet realized the full potential there. Would I love to see another model that works in, in a more urban setting? Yes. And I want to make sure there's a clear distinction. I think the four cornerstones and stages model will work in any co-op. De- it's a basic developmental tool that makes sure that you all the steps you need to to have a successful startup, regardless of what size. The model mm-hmm. aspect that is the challenge is the financial models that we're currently working with Mm -hmm. become very, very hard to scale down below a certain size or a certain amount of sales. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that would be, you know, that's kind of the elusive other model is can you do a store with substantially less refrigeration? Well, you know, obviously that affects what you're going to carry in the store. And will it Mm -hmm. be profitable? You know, th- that's the question that I, in my opinion, is still the open question. And, you know, it may be, and again, you know, you look at what's most, what we would consider a large food co-op is a very small conventional grocery store. So what we're seeing as a small food co-op, conventional grocery stores would not even begin to look at. You know, they're not going to look at a 2,500 square foot store. There's no attraction to them whatsoever because they look at that and say, massive money loser forever. But yet mm-hmm. we've got a lot of people in the co-op world who want to open stores at that size. Yes. And, you know, although it is very possible that a number of those people want to, to open them that size simply because they don't know that that's, by, so far, by all accounts, that's not a viable size. You know, they're not aware yeah. of that yet. They haven't gotten down that, the path far enough to realize that. And okay. my experience with startup groups is, especially in the very early stages, they dramatically underestimate the resources needed to open a co-op. Again, you yeah. don't know. You don't know what you don't know. So, yeah. you know, you think, oh, we'll buy some used equipment for, you know, $60,000, $70,000. We'll get uh, everything we need to start up a store, and we're good to go. Well, yeah. you know, your point-of-sale system is going to cost you $60,000. Yeah. So 
you know, where does that leave you? Your, you know, your, your cheese display case is going to be, you know, 14000 on its own. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so all these things start adding up real quickly. And then, of course, also there's, well, we'll just buy all, you know, used stuff at auction. And then you get it and realize that, you know, the, sale, the yeah. seals have cracked because they weren't stored properly and all the copper fittings, including your refrigeration tubing, has been stolen because copper was... Okay. You know, so valuable, right. and all these other things that again you don't know. So yeah. it's hard. You know, if somebody could create, and UNFI does this to some degree. You know, they will help connect a co-op with reputable refrigeration companies that will sell refurbished product. But they make a real right. distinction between not used, refurbished. You know, right. don't don't go out and to Craigslist and buy yourself a used cooler. But if you buy right. it from a reputable, you know, anyways, sort of a... You, need, down you need to buy something that's been tested and is known to work, and et cetera. Yeah, yeah. because it's not, yeah, just okay. your, it's not just your initial startup cost that's the, that comes into play in those decisions. It's also how does that work with customer retention and customer, you know, service mm-hmm. when somebody says, you know, my kid's birthday party is this afternoon and I'm here to get the soy ice cream because they can't have regular ice cream, and oh, your freezer went out last night and you don't have any. Right. So that is a bad situation. Yeah. You know, that, so, I, yeah, anyway. I hear that. Yeah, the equipment thing is misleading for a lot of people. They don't realize what maintenance, and, and particularly when you're buying, they like you say, they don't know what they don't know. They don't know right. how difficult it is to buy used uh, any kind of used equipment, you know, as right. is. And you're you know, you really, you could be getting something that's pretty much worthless. Right, yeah. those expensive fixtures are the are you know around the at the w- four walls of the store. So mm. if you make your store smaller, you're still buying freezers and coolers. They don't you know a cooler half the size isn't half right. the cost. So right. that's one of the problems with scaling down to a small store is your sales per your your cost per square foot actually goes up, and for yes. that matter, your labor per square foot goes up too because you know you don't. Mm. If you have a 6,000 square foot store and a 3,000 square foot store, you don't pay your general manager half the amount, right. you know. Yeah. So right. it's something, you know, it's kind of where the, the lie of like a flat tax, it's the same, you know, yeah. false logic. Um, well, so okay, well, that segues nicely if you're ready for it. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you have numbers off the top of your head, but for a long time we hung in there at like about 300, maybe 325 food co-ops in the U.S., Okay. And do you have numbers on how many startups we have recently? I would bet that there are 300 groups currently working on starting new co-ops. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it, it's phenomenal. Now, a number of those will not get there, but nevertheless, oh, sure. it's phenomenal, oh, yeah. and there are more coming every day. I mean, I get people hmm. calling me, okay, maybe not every single day, but it's rare yeah. that a week doesn't go by that somebody out of the blue doesn't come forward and say, hey, I'm in this community, and I, you know, I might like to start a food co-op. Great. And you, know. and, you, and you say largely due to food co-op 500 and food co-op initiative. Is it uh, also... I think also forces in, the, in our country and in the marketplace, but I think in the mm-hmm. past, if you got this idea, hey, I might want to do this, yeah. You would find nothing out there to help you whatsoever. Whereas now, if you yeah. Google, how do I start a food co-op, you instantly come to a whole yep. booklet called How to Start a Food Co-op, and yep. you come to Food Co-op 500, or I'm sorry, uh, Food Co-op Initiative, which used yep. to be Food Co-op 500. You, know, you instantly right. find you know, that there's a whole section on the CDSCC website for startups. You know, that yep. There are resources and- that... And a lot of these groups do tap into those right away. You know, I talk to them the first time, and they say, I've already watched some of your webinars, and, you know, Mm -hmm. I've already looked at this piece. I've been in contact with Stuart or Jake or Rosie at FCI. So, you know, there are having these these resources is, I think, critical. And much of this upsurge in interest would you attribute to the financial crisis, people sort of looking for alternative approaches? I, I think some of it is, and... Have you ever read, I'm not going to remember the, the uh, author's mm. name, but Shifting Involvements? It's a book about mm. economics written by this yeah. e- economist that basically mm-hmm. describes this 40-year cycle mm. of altruism and what would be the opposite of altruism, of you know, greed or per, you know, 
cynicism. Yeah. The cynicism, yeah. That we go that that there are these really well documented cycles where you go from being very outward mm-hmm. focused, thinking things suck and we must make them better and I'm gonna work hard on that. And you do mm-hmm. that and you do make some progress, but you also what typically happens is that you don't mm-hmm. achieve the high ideals that you initially set out to, so you become disillusioned and at some point a large group of people say Forget it. I'm just going to do, you know, work for myself now. I, I need yeah. to look out for number one. And yeah. then things go downhill until you get disgusted again and say, no, 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 this, things have gone too far. We need to start. Right. So, I, you know, I think we can chart that the initial increase in food crop development coincided with one of those troughs mm-hmm. where people started saying, we got to do something. We are now yeah. looking and thinking, you know, okay, how do we resist that, disillusionment, how do we create more realistic expectations, how do we work hard to ensure that the outcomes are as positive as they can be, you know, that's Mm -hmm. really a uh, sort of a larger philosophical driver for those of us who are trying to serve these groups. So we have these 300-something food Mm -hmm. co-ops now, and NCGA membership is at in the low 100-something. So, yeah, right. something like that. And, again, they can – I don't know the numbers, but they can certainly provide them. Or I know. I seem to recall a few years ago it was 110 out of 330, that something like be. that. Yeah. It was roughly a third. Mm-hmm. Probably the thir- the biggest third of the food co-ops in general were in NCGA. Probably. Yeah. And with some exceptions, but, yeah. Um, what is our strategy for helping the lower two-thirds? Yeah. How do we help them? What are we doing? I know you guys are talking about this all the time, but it's just on. But I, I, but you know, a lot of people don't know that you know, the the food co-op consultants are actually talking about this, and so I want to sort of expose that a little, even if it's just broad, even if it's just broad speculation. It was like, how do we help the lower two thirds of the food co-ops in the country? What can we do for them? Sure, absolutely, and I think you know it is something we look at and talk about, but it's also, I mean. You know, it's the old 80-20 rule, and mm. the 80-20 rule exists for a reason that, you know, 20% of your, uh, you know, of a, 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 generally the rule means that 20% of the population in a given group gets 80% of the resources. Right, and, right. And that may sound horrible, but it actually makes a certain amount of sense in the context of like a food co-op because that 20% is also doing 80% of the business. Mm. Mm. So... Certainly what I look at, and I think that there's a lot of us who are thinking along these lines, is that the quality of research, study, materials, training, all the resources we can put together that so far seem to work best for co-ops, developmental Mm -hmm. co-ops of a certain size and sales volume, they sure ought to work Mm -hmm. for the smaller ones, too. So in other uh-huh. words, if, if you are in an existing co-op that is, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. chugging along at a much smaller size but is facing real challenges, or you want to serve your market better or right. your owners yep. more, so you want to expand, mm-hmm. these materials, these resources we're creating are going to totally be applicable for you to, you it's know, chart what? a path. However, you've got yeah, to come I, forward and say, yes, we want to engage yeah. in this. You know, our board yep. is going to have to be supportive of this, our, our management and staff, and our owners. So in that regard, you know, and there, again, there's resources for that, too, for creating mm-hmm. that alignment, for getting, mm-hmm. you know, all, all of your stakeholders on board so that you can do this really effectively. Um, and so I think you mentioned this a few minutes ago. You said the four cornerstones and the three stages is a developmental model that works for any size of co-op. Um, if, I'm, right. if I'm hearing you correctly, it's the financial model is where the limits come in. Absolutely. Correct. Yeah, okay. Correct. And, it, and right. you know, part of the four cornerstones in three stages is you do this feasibility work, which may yeah. lead you to the conclusion that your, mo- your, your project is not viable. Or it could stands. lead you in the direction of TPSS, which was 1,000 square feet, $2 million a year. Right. And after we survived our own mistakes in the expansion, 
you know, TPSS yeah. seems to be doing very well now, and maybe mm-hmm. in spite of itself, but it's doing very well. Yeah, it, right. And yes, you may come to that, but again, if you if the research shows that that is yeah. a mm-hmm. viable strategy, then you know, fantastic. The problem is. Yeah. Generally, yeah. you need an urban environment to create, and you know, look at what TPSS is. At least the TP mm-hmm. side of it. You know, what do you think the median income is in the? Yeah, you know, oh yeah, way upscale. Yeah. Right, and and your education level is off the charts. You know, yes, the number exactly. of PhDs in a in a you know you, you couldn't swing a dead cat if you'll pardon the expression without hitting a PhD, <laughs> at least in the parking lot, you know, or inside the store. <laughs> So in order to generate that volume of sales out of that small a footprint, you need some fairly special circumstances. The problem we see is with stores that do open very small or what we see more often, what I see personally more often is they start with a, you know, thinking we'll start with a buyer's club or a, you know, a, mm-hmm. a little, sh- you know, buying group and we'll use the proceeds from that to finance the rest of our project. Well, that just doesn't happen. I've just never seen the proceeds be Mm -hmm. anything that's even close to financing it. And what seems to happen more often is it actually drains the energy because the founding group puts all their effort and resources into that initial Mm -hmm. project, whatever it is. And in the meantime, they're not doing financial feasibility work. They're not going through the stages and assembling the cornerstones, so they're not right. making any progress on their, you know, larger goal of a food, of a store. And again, if they don't they're want a store, that's different. Great, open a buying club, too busy open a keep, farmers market. They're too, bu- they're too busy keeping the wheels turning in order to actually achieve the larger goal. Correct, basically. and those wheels are not generating the return that they yeah. possibly naively expected. Friendly City cost about 1.7 uh, million dollars to get open. There's no possible yeah. way we would have generated that from the proceeds of a buying club. No way. It would have taken us so 150 these, years. So these lower two-thirds, they can look at the four cornerstones in three stages. Mm-hmm. They can do their feasibility. They can do their research so they could see what their options are. And a lot of that, correct me if I'm wrong, would come down to the size of their market in the end. They would be discovering how big their market is, what their potential for growth is, and they're going to get an answer one way yes. or the other. Correct. Right? I mean, it, yes, and it's less, the market size, I think, is less limiting than what they choose, than either the, the financial situation in their market. I mean, we're seeing co-ops that can be viable in, you know, fairly small towns. The, um, it's, you know, the market size, I think, is to some degree, I mean, especially if you have a triple whammy of really small market with a really low median income, really low education level, that's a problem. But mm-hmm. it, that's somewhat unusual, and it's somewhat unusual, at least in my experience, to see a group that has mm-hmm. all of that. Even th- some of these urban groups I'm seeing still have, mm-hmm. especially you know, if they're situated at kind of an edge between mm-hmm. an underserved neighborhood that might be more challenged in terms of its you know, economic position, but mm-hmm. also on the edge of a, of a neighborhood that's more stable or, or higher up in that regard, that can be a great mm-hmm. way to situate a co-op that can really do some great things in a community. Um, okay. So it's more a matter of can we generate that, the amount of sales from... Which is maybe more of a strategic question it in is a way. More, than, absolutely, it's a strategic question. Yeah. Okay. You can as, also, opposed to a, as opposed to a static question of either we've got it or we don't, Right. There is a bigger question of we might be able to get it even if we don't have it. Absolutely. And it's yeah. you know, and is our vision does our vision need to be adjusted so that it suits mm-hmm. you know, a financial a level of financial viability. So, you know, a mm-hmm. lot of groups I think start thinking about a, you know, two thousand square foot store because it's hard to imagine. If you went out, I think if you went today and just like pulled somebody in any situation, and said, how big do you think, you know, the shopper's food warehouse is in square foot? They're not going to have any conception. If you do it in the right. co-op, I don't think they're going to have any conception. You right. know, oh, the co-op is 500 square feet. Well, no, it's right. 6,000 square feet. Or they're going to say, oh, I think it's 100,000 square feet. So mm-hmm. some of it is just a lack of kind of understanding of what is the size. So they say 2,000 because that's a nice number. 
But, yeah. you know, the strategic question is, can a 2,000-square-foot store be made to be financially viable and serve our owners? So, right. you know, again, maybe it could be if it's a really high-end specialty wine and cheese store. It, that might right. be really viable. Does that serve our yeah. owners? Maybe it does, but that's a question. Yeah. Versus do okay. we want you know, this to be a place where people can do a lot of their family shopping in a very healthy, just way? Mm-hmm. And you know, that then becomes mm-hmm. a bigger strategic question of how much space do you need to do that? Um, okay. You know, that, that, well, that, speaking to that, you said 50K to 150K with high education income. levels. Just There's median of a, income. Yeah, and that can vary right. because you know, your market may, like our market, it's not as expensive to exist in. So for us, 44K is, you know, we're, we're making it there, but our rent is not what it would be in, to, in an urban area. And some yeah. of our other costs, you know, we don't have to pay our GM quite as much as if we were in an urban area. And so is that, are we stuck with that? Don't know. You guys want to talk about it, though. Yeah. I mean, that's... Because, you know, there's... The lefties in particular are going to say, hey, you know, shouldn't we be have co-ops for working class people? And how do we, how do, we do that? Yes. The, the, well, the, working class, the working class people need cheap, healthy food maybe more than anybody else does. Yeah, absolutely. Okay? But, you know, and that's so where, how, like, how, do we, how do we help them? How do we well, do that? For, absolutely. Yeah. And that's where, like, looking at the British model, where, you know, uh-huh. every co-op is not independent. It's the co-op. It's a national co-op. So yeah, you can like use... Cha- more like a chain. More like yeah, a chain. Right. So you can use yeah. these massive resources to open up a co op anywhere you need it and want it. And of course there is still some element of you want your community to be organized behind it, you want mm-hmm. the community to, you know, really desire this co op. But if mm-hmm. you can draw on those kind of resources, then you don't have to get all of the money from within the community to open it, which can be very challenging in a lower income you've, community. You've got deep pockets because it's essentially a chain. Yeah, because it's a it's got a large central organization, which the U.S. model has really been counter to that, where it's always been mm-hmm. decentralized, mm-hmm. and you know UNFI and NCGA provide a little bit of a central infrastructure, but not like the co-op in England, where you've got you know a really yeah. robust central infrastructure. So that would be mm-hmm. one way to to think about this model, and I think there's some people who are thinking about is that something that we should look at in the U.S. Mm-hmm. going to a national model like that. there, you know, And that's a whole other conversation, but that would be one way to think about it. But certainly, or another way to look at it would be, or another way to potentially address it is, you've got your, mm-hmm. you know, like super achieving co-ops out there, your Blooming mm-hmm. Foods, your Wheatsvilles, your, right. I don't know, right. you know, Peoples, um, or uh, PCC mm-hmm. Market. So if we can start unlocking some of the, equity and strength of these larger co-ops to create satellite stores in underserved yeah. communities, you know, that yeah. would be another way. Now, of course, that depends on having a strong co-op nearby. You're not going to do it two states away. But, right. you know, I think that, for instance, Outpost in Milwaukee, they just, mm-hmm. I don't know how they did it, whether they had to bid on it, but they now have a little commissary type, very, very small little place inside the big hospital in Milwaukee. Wow. So they're the snack bar now, basically. So instead of getting, wow. you know, Marriott institutional food, you're getting stuff that was prepared at the co-op and brought over, you know, sandwiches wow. that are, have organic ingredients. You're having, you know, high-quality stuff as wow. what you can grab there if you're going there to visit your brother-in-law who just had his hernia operated on. So wow. yeah, it's a, and to me that's a you know a model that would potentially work for a small group where again you're leveraging the strength and the resources of this much larger co-op, um, and even if it is an independent store, even still you know we would uh, it would be awesome to see and we are seeing like Blooming Foods is doing enormous amount of work at their expense at helping out other nearby co-ops that are struggling. Um, mm-hmm. Now it would have probably been much better if the relationship could have been created before they ever opened to make sure, oh, sure that they didn't get in that situation. 
But nevertheless, again, just kind of yeah. rain, you know, these are the kind of things that w- that yeah. I think could work and that certainly are being looked at in the co-op world as to, you know, how we could get co-ops yeah. in, you know, these locations that might not be as financially uh, yeah. perfect or, you know, um, desirable. I seem to recall that Willie Street in Madison was also doing a lot to try to help some of the smaller co-ops there in yeah, Madison. Could, I mean, several. I think many of them do. And again, it's that sixth principle in action. Um, yeah. You mentioned Wegmans, and this is very much of a sort of a, almost a worst-case scenario, but I'm also thinking about some of the things I've heard out of Canada mm-hmm. and whether, you know, are we looking at the food co-ops in the U.S. losing natural and organic as their differentiator, as their unique selling proposition. Yeah. You know, maybe so, but I think that if that's been their pri- – I think it's time for them to change. I don't think that right. should be their, their primary differentiator. I think and their so, service to community, cooperative principles, the justice side mm-hmm. of it, um, yes. I think that yes. you know, needs to be their differentiator. They need to do everything else just as well. And, and their service and, level. And I think that is an area that they still absolutely can excel – competitively at their ability to actually, you know, mm-hmm. help a person uh, understand how this food works and what it means to them. I, so, I'm thinking this might be the lead or the heart of one of my angles here is that, you know, because I agree with you, and I think it's kind of obvious mm-hmm. if Walmart has become the biggest organic retailer, right. okay, then the the co-ops need to, you know, and whether they're complacent or not, the co-ops need to look at this and say, how do we differentiate ourselves in a world where you can get organic at Walmart? Sure, okay? absolutely. Yep. What does that look like? Right. And, and so, our, what is our value? In, What's our real value then? Yeah. And I think and, the real, uh, you know, cause it, and it may be that some of these markets that have a substantially lower income level mm-hmm you know, those stores would be substantially less natural and organic, maybe more conventional, but with certain mm-hmm. key areas or certain key educational components that say, you know, if yes. you're on very limited a very limited budget, here are the five organic items that really make the biggest difference mm-hmm. in, in, you know, your health or in your exposure to toxins. You know, yeah, and... It, yeah, Just and maybe leveraging. Yeah, because, you know, poor folks get food allergies, too. Uh, so. Exactly, absolutely. And, and again, yeah. this is, you know, to me, this is the differentiator. It's not so much, yeah, we got this great food. It's how do we, what do we do with this food? How right, do we and it food? reminds me of the value of the Berkeley Co-op um, was, you know, they had a home economist at Absolutely. the customer service desk. Exactly. Right, and, they, and the people, the members and the customers, the people in the community, didn't know how to prepare food for whatever social reason, socio-economic right. reason. There was a lot of food education that needed to be done. Absolutely. I mean, there was there was a jingle you can find it online for bananas because you know American housewives didn't know what to do with a banana. When is it ripe? Yeah. How do we store well, it? Where do we? How well, do we eat it? So there was a jingle that was written that's really clever and funny about you know don't put it in the refrigerator. Here's what it looks like when you when it's perfect. Here's different ways you can use it. And, and so you still see that. Pardon? You still see we still have this t- a terrible need for, for food education, maybe even at the lower income level. We do. Even more at the lower and, income and level. And the, yeah. the food education not only serves a great purpose, but it creates connection between people. And at least for me, that's like my personal thing, that like yeah. that's where co-ops can thrive, is that... Okay. You know, especially if you're living in a community that may have a higher crime rate, um, that the access to, you know, the things that many of us in our affluent communities take, it, take for granted, parks mm-hmm. and, and public pools and all these, you know, kind of shared resources, if you've got fewer of those or they're in, in less good condition, you know, having really good solid human connection where you can come in and somebody says, hey, Joe, how are you today? You know, how's your, mm-hmm. how are your allergies? Did that food, yeah. that stuff that yeah. you tried last week, how would it go for you? You know, that stuff, yeah. I think, is has a value wow. that far exceeds the food itself. Yeah. You know, that human connection, that care, that mutual understanding. And that's what, you know, a co-op is a mutual aid society. 
Um, yeah. So you've got all those pieces, the social piece, the mutual piece. Um, and yeah. that is where I think we can still absolutely serve all kinds of markets. It's just how we how do we get the numbers to work so we can continue to serve those markets rather than right. do it briefly and then, you know, flame out. It's interesting to think that if the, the bright future of U.S. food co-ops may lie outside the strictly natural and organic sector, that yeah. that's not... That's not necessarily our unique selling proposition going forward anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's still, that's still an important piece. You know, we still love that, and, and it's still, you know, there's no denying yeah. that that food is it's a higher value overall. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if you want to look at how we're going to reach the maximum number of people in the world yeah. or in our country, it's probably going to be a, a mix. Yeah. Well, um, okay, last thing. I'm going to, another devil's advocacy question about the consumer co-op model in general. Mm -hmm. If you're familiar with Tom Webb, or you cover some of the, his perspectives on consumer co-ops. I haven't read a lot of them, but I'm familiar with them. I mean, I know who he is. Yeah. yeah. And he, he, he's, you know, I attended a seminar he gave at the 2007 Worker Co-op Conference in uh, North Carolina, and... Mm -hmm. um, and he was really down on consumer co-ops. Mm -hmm. And I think he, he may have been discouraged about what was going on in Canada in particular. Mm -hmm. But he felt that cons the consumer co-op movement, at least in Canada, had essentially lost its principles, did not, d did not see itself as providing significantly different or greater value, mm -hmm. and that that's why it was failing. But he, he also he tended to say that there's some fundamental problems with the consumer co-op model, that tend to take it in that direction in the long run. And mm -hmm. things like, for example, low voter turnout for board elections and low member turnout for general meetings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that uh, we've seen, I've seen plenty of that firsthand as well, and it oh, concerns, yeah. me, gr concerns me greatly. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking for fishing for more general perspectives from you about, you know, about what this angle that I've heard from Tom Webb and from others about consumer co-ops. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and, you know, does the model have fundamental issues that we're not successfully addressing or that can't be successfully addressed, or what do you think? Mm, yes, I do agree that there are some challenges there. I don't agree that they cannot be addressed. I think, mm -hmm. that, you know, this model takes more work, plain and simple. Uh, and, okay. you know, if you want to just, like, put a, you know, open a store and put sale signs in the window – and negotiate how you pay your employees the little, as little as possible and how you pay your vendors as little as possible. You can run a successful store, at least for you as the owner of the store, and potentially for the shoppers. Mm -hmm. But it's a false success and it's a false economy. And right. I think that, that that's where we really, the message, you know, one of the messages that we need to get across is that when a co-op is really doing it well, it's not only, I mean, it's the consumer cooperative side of it, but it's the, it, there ought to be the values behind it, too, that we're saying, I mean, I think mm. pay per hour in a food co-op versus a conventional grocery, you know, you yeah. get paid a lot better in a food co-op if you're an employee. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's the other, to me, that's a really important piece is employees and, and suppliers. You know, there was just uh -huh. a great piece in one of our local blogs here in town about how, you know, the food co-op is in the same building as the Dollar General. And uh -huh. so you've got like these two, and in between the two businesses is the food pantry from the Catholic Church. So, right. you, you know, you've got this picture of intense hunger and you've got this totally false economy of made in China, extremely low quality, extremely inexpensive right. goods. Right. In contrast to this, quote, expensive, unquote, food co-op. But the reality is Dollar General makes far more profit per dollar than the food co-op does. Uh -huh. You know, we're paying our, our employees fair wages. We're paying right. our vendors fair wages or, or a fair price for their goods. We're willing to pay more to encourage our suppliers to do use better practices. You know? So 
to me, that's where the real meat of this difference comes in, is it's not just how much is our price versus Whole Foods or, mm-hmm. or Safeway. Well, no. It's can we begin to get people to think more about it all the way back down, because basically it comes back down to them. But, I mean, but, but I'm trying to speak more specifically to how is the consumer co-op model in the U.S. doing in terms of member participation? I don't think it's doing superbly, but I think that, you know, the number of members, it's, it's the sleeping giant. You know, the number of uh-huh. members are there, and, and I think growing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now the challenge is to begin to really get this message out there and get yeah, it out there. What do you think there. of that? Do you have examples to cite or models to, to the proven models out there about maybe some of the larger co-ops or any mm-hmm. of the co-ops? that are really successfully energizing their membership bases? Um, I don't, you know, the kind of things that come to mind, I don't know if these are really proven yet, but we are seeing cross-sector cooperative activities as one mm-hmm. aspect. So, like, uh, Austin, yes, Texas yes. has their, you know, whatever mm-hmm. they call it, their Tanks, co-op. Austin think tank. Yes, the, think, the cooperative yes. think tank, correct, where they've got, you know, the food co-op, credit unions, housing co-ops, bakery co-ops, their brew pub co-op, you know, all these different groups coming together with a primary focus being that they want everyone, they want to raise awareness of cooperatives in the city so that anyone who's thinking about starting a business starts thinking, do I want to open a conventional business or a cooperative business? And, you know, I think that's one really great area where it takes it out of the stereotype of, you know, it's just those hippies, I don't want to listen to them from the food co-op world. And it, you know, you start connecting with things like electric co-ops and you start connecting to a massive a number of people. So yes, I yes. think that's one that could be a really great place to start is those and we've started a group here, our local inter co-op alliance that has been really wonderful to just even so far I think it's only been the benefit so far has really mostly been to us to the cooperators themselves. But it's uh-huh. so great to sit down yeah. and have lunch once a quarter with, you know, the beef co-op and the electric co-op and the water co-op and the collective restaurant and the food co-op and the credit unions. You know, it's just, yeah. and it's a start. From there, we begin to think about, and we are consciously thinking about, how do we spread this message out that look at what we're doing, look at how different we are, look at how much this mutual effort benefits us all in our community and our society. So, you know, that, mm-hmm. that to me is a tangible way that I think groups can begin to look at it. And just generally, food co-ops, I think, the education, information, and training principle has often been interpreted as that those are all geared towards the product, when really that was not the intent of the original writers of the principles. It was, it was education about cooperatives. And, and that's something that I think there's more help needed all the way around, but, you know, that that I think can happen. There's great uh-huh. stories that can be told. There's more and more excellent materials. There's that absolutely wonderful video on YouTube that I think the Rochdale, you know, the the co-op in England put together about the Rochdale Equitable Society, the history of it narrated, you know, beautifully done graphically and, and everything. You know, the more and more of that kind of stuff to spread the word that this is why we exist and this is, you know, the value that we bring can help make that connection and also get people thinking more about these bigger questions about, you know, what is economic justice? Right. What is fair? You know, is buying at Walmart where I can get the most for my dollar fair? And mm-hmm. actually, mm-hmm. am I getting the most for my dollar when you consider, you know, that my factory job may be lost because of the, you know, Walmart's desire to have the lowest possible prices. You know, that's a, I think closing that loop or creating that sense of this is a loop is really important. This has been a production of GEO, Grassroots Economic Organizing. Find us on the web at geo.coop.com.